Awesome. So thank you guys so much for having me uh, and having all of us. Uh, my name is Jameson Hill. I'm a principal on the investment team at Bain Capital Ventures. Before I was at Bain Capital Ventures, I was at Bonobos, uh, which is a men's clothing brand out of New York. I worked on the finance team there and then did retail operations, marketing operations. And before that, I was at Bain & Company as a consultant, working mainly with retail and consumer packaged goods companies. And so I've had the uh, tremendous privilege of seeing retail from the consultant, operator, and non-investor side. Uh, um, a little bit about Bain Capital Ventures. So for those of you who aren't familiar with us, uh, Bain Capital investment firm founded back in 1984. Uh, the whole, it was a friendly spin out of Bain & Company. The whole idea was to take the data-driven, results-oriented approach, develop a Bain & Company, and apply it to investing. And so uh, the first check that we wrote was a $600,000 check to open the first staples. So we've been kicking around retail for a really long time. Uh, through the 80s and 90s, we continued doing venture and growth investing and also turned our attention to other asset classes, private equity, public equity, debt, life sciences. Um, and so in 2001, the need became apparent to articulate the various strategies. That's when Bain Capital Ventures as a dedicated venture fund was born. Since then, we've had uh, the pleasure of working with a number of companies, logos you see up there, uh, a, a few companies particularly in retail and retail technology. In retail, we were early investors in Jet, so the Walmart last year. Uh, and Rent the Runway. From a retail technology perspective, we were investors in Hook Logic, which sold to Critio last year, as well as uh, Experticity. So, you know, my job involves sitting down with folks. I focus, you know, uh, sort of the majority of my time on supply chain and logistics technology. So some of the companies up there I work very closely with are Symphony Commerce, an e-commerce um, platform, as well as Forkites, which is a supply chain visibility platform. Uh, as well as Onera and Flow, who I'll introduce uh, in a second. And so, um, you know, my job involves sitting down with entrepreneurs in supply chain technology, uh, listening to their pitches, listening to the ways that they think that they can sort of reinvent the space, and trying to figure out sort of, you know, where there is real value. So we're going to play a little bit of a game right now. It's called Silicon Valley Buzzword Bingo. So how many of you in sort of the last year have heard a pitch from a company that uses two of the terms up here. How many? Three. Four? Same pitch, four of these buzzwords. <laughs> Five? All right, four is as high as we went, it looks like. Um, so there's a lot of hype, and there's a lot of true value behind some of these. Uh, when we turn to the panel, uh, we'll actually dive into some of these areas a little bit more deeply. Um, but just wanted to provide sort of a quick introduction into some uh, areas that we find um, particularly interesting. So again, continuing with our bingo, how many people have heard the term artificial intelligence in the last week? How many people are <laughs> sick of hearing the term artificial <laughs> intelligence? I'm with you. So, uh, you know, artificial intelligence a lot of people talk about it. Not a lot of people know uh, exactly what it means or what it is. Uh, the thing that we find most interesting and the most promising approach within artificial intelligence is something called machine learning. Machine learning involves taking a set of data and using it as an example to teach a machine to do something without uh, explicit human instruction. And so when we think about it, and we've been hearing throughout the conference, you know, interesting applications of machine learning, particularly within things like forecasting, and inventory management. I really think about it in terms of anywhere that you can take disparate forms of data, combine them, and drive new and uh, differential insight is a good place to apply machine learning. Internet of Things, another very hot topic right now. You've got a lot of technology providers who come to you and say, hey, let me deploy these new sensor networks across your supply chain and give you some additional visibility or what have you. Um, you know, one of the things that we really look for and the things that we like when we meet companies are those who can leverage already existing be, uh, sensor networks and data because your supply chains are already spitting out a bunch of data and using that to make it actionable versus, you know, ne necessarily needing to do million dollar year long deployments. Uh, blockchain, so a lot of people when they think about blockchain think about Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. You know, we're pretty interested in the technology underneath it. The idea of being a distributed database of transactions uh, that is secure and that someone can't come retroactively uh, and change is interesting when you think about the number of trading partners that, um, and suppliers and manufacturers that exist within a supply chain. And then, you know, with others, 
drones, a lot of people, most of the attention goes to using drones for last mile delivery. We've seen some interesting applications inside warehouses doing things like asset inspection. Um, augmented reality, I would say similar. It's not just Pokemon Go. Uh, there's other sort of using it for knowledge management uh, and uh, safety um, within manufacturing facilities uh, and elsewhere. And so uh, anyway, all of this new technology, all these trends are converging to sort of make your lives more interesting, but also more challenging in that the number of technology providers has absolutely exploded. And so in the same way that you guys uh, get pitched quite a bit in order to use new technologies, we get pitched to invest in them. We're excited about this space. We're extremely bullish on it. Um, and actually, you know, I see some of you guys taking photos. Take a photo of it. If you'd like the real thing, shoot me an email. I'm happy to share it with you. Um, and you know, we at Bank Capital Ventures are really excited about this space. And so with sort of that um, little intro, I'd like to introduce our two panelists. Um, so Sahil Gupta is the co-founder and CEO of Onera. Onera is machine learning based um, inventory optimization for multi-channel retailers. And then Rob Keeve is the co-founder CEO of Flow, which is a cloud-based system that enables cross-border commerce. So uh, I'll sort of, for our first question, just to kind of get you guys um, a little bit more about your background and sort of how you came to start your businesses. The thing that I'm really interested in is sort of, you know, in my job, I meet a lot of tech interesting technologies that are looking for a use case, or you meet some interesting business problems where you can't really find the right technology. So I'm curious, how did you guys, in starting your companies, think about bringing the right technology to the right business problem at the right time? Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Jameson. Um, <clears throat> I'm Rob Key from Flow. Um, so to answer the question, Flow exists to help brands and retailers go cross-border. So I think the problem was well-defined. It didn't need uncovering. The pain was obvious. We all receive site traffic coming from overseas, but it's not always converted. It's certainly not converted efficiently into being customers. Um, the genesis behind Flow was my co-founder, uh, Mike Brizek, who was the co-founder and CTO of Gilt uh, here in the city. Um, and he had this very particular problem as a principal. So he was managing supply chain and the technology at the time. And over a period of about four years, they built it up into over $100 million in international business. But to do so, there was a myriad of challenges. How do you localize the website? How do you calculate duty and tax? How do you ship efficiently overseas? How do you take payments for international consumers? Um, so I think in our case, the problem was extremely well-defined. Uh, it's tech capitalizing on your international traffic and creating incremental revenue. Um, and more than that, it wasn't a silver bullet for how technology could solve one pain point. It's how can a myriad of different technologies be brought together to solve lots of small uh, paper cuts. Um, so that's uh, what Flow is. It's designed to bring, to remove the friction of international commerce and bring Flow, hence the name Flow. Uh, so the kind of technologies that we brought to bear on the problem are, um, well, I'll probably come on to talk about some of these, but RESTful API for very simple integration to enable e-commerce merchants to localize their front-end experience. We brought artificial intelligence and indeed machine learning to the question of duty and tax calculation uh, because the training set is complicated and it needs continuous improvement. Um, international payments, uh, we have deep integrations into lots of different types of acquirers. So there we're using various different types of uh, technologies to capture payments, including uh, blockchain approaches. And then on the shipping side, uh, one of the buzzwords that I didn't see on your slide was virtualization. <laughs> uh, I think it deserves there. Yeah. Um, and so I'm going to try to overuse the term now to compensate. Uh, we virtualize various things in the supply chain to make that more efficient. Um, I'll come on to talk about it, but in particular, the idea of going international, the shipping needs to be super efficient if you're going to keep the cost of international shipping down. And to do that, the more cross-docking you can remove from the process and the more line hauling you can remove, the cheaper the international shipping. So we set out from the outset to virtualize that using software and data and not needing physical assets and trucks and uh, clipboards to do that. Cool. Um, so my name is Sahil Gupta. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Onera. And just as a little bit of context, 
uh, as Jameson mentioned, you know, we use machine learning and data science to help retailers specifically optimize uh, their omni-channel fulfillment capabilities, such as ship from store and pick up in store. Um, and so, you know, when we started the company, we actually kind of came from it from two separate angles. Uh, so one angle we said at kind of a sort of uh, macro level, you know, we felt like supply chain technology was not leveraging best in class uh, data approaches. So specifically leveraging uh, data science, machine learning, or cloud computing. Uh, and the reason we thought that was important was because when we looked at the supply chain, you know, we said it's really in our minds, uh, you know, comprised of effectively two layers. Uh, those layers are, you know, the infrastructure or the plumbing of, you know, how do we get things done? How do we move something from point A to B? And then there are the decisions on, you know, what do we need to do within our supply chain? So simple questions like, you know, how much inventory should we buy or where should we allocate it or how should we fulfill? And we said those questions are actually fundamentally data-driven questions. So if you abstract them out from the system or the process, they're data-driven questions. So how can we use more data-driven technologies to actually solve or improve those capabilities? So we, we took that thesis and said, okay, you know, how do we apply it? And you know, we started to point that within retail uh, really for two fundamental reasons, which was one, and obviously you guys in the room know this probably better than anyone, which is one, the post-purchase experience was dramatically changing. And so that was gonna completely disrupt the way traditional retailers thought about their supply chain, thought about their fulfillment network, thought about how they fulfilled uh, orders to the customer. Uh, and then two, it was really sort of this notion that the store or the definition of the store was changing dramatically. And so from both a kind of definitional perspective as well as the supply chain perspective, retailers were going to need to rethink how to utilize their stores. Uh, they were applying a lot of uh, investments from an infrastructure and operations perspective in enabling those stores uh, within their supply chain. But similarly speaking, there was going to be a lot of questions on how do we more effectively utilize those stores or how do we optimize those capabilities? So we sort of looked at that kind of uh, lens and said, you know, this feels like a really good uh, place to apply some of these technologies or some of these methodologies. And so we actually just started to, you know, from how did we start the company perspective, we just started to call uh, retailers and ask them, you know, as you guys are enabling ship from store and pick up in store, what are the pain points that you guys are facing? How can data help solve those uh, different challenges? And that's sort of you know, what led us down the path of uh, you know, what we're doing today and, and the types of products that we build today for our customers. That's great, thank you. So you know, as we look at different categories of enterprise software, we see you know, why, uh, varying rates of cloud penetration. So if you take something like customer uh, relationship management, 50% you know, of uh, software is deployed in the cloud. You look at HR technology, it's over 30%. You look at supply chain technology, it's generally very low in sort of the you know, mid-single digits. The reason for that historically has been you know, these are operational systems. And if your instance of Salesforce goes down for an hour, you know, it stinks. But hopefully your business doesn't grind to a halt. That's not true if your e-commerce platform, your ERP goes down. And so you know, I'm curious as to how you guys thought about sort of building on the cloud the, the benefits that you can leverage from the cloud that are unique and sort of you know, how to think about the penetration of cloud within kind of bro the broader category of supply chain software. Uh, so from our side, there are a few benefits. And I think from our client side, the brand side, there's also several benefits. Um, from our side, it was the obvious starting point. Um, from capacity management perspective, it expands and is elastic to our needs. We can maintain a single code base and distribute that R&D cost across many clients and not have to worry about uh, in on-premise installations. Um, and also from a API perspective, we can focus on the quality of API to make integrations very simple and not have to worry about uh, SIs getting intermediating between us and our clients. Um, and from a client's perspective, I think the benefits are uh, very quick time to value. They can be up and running in days or weeks because it's a case of simply plugging in API into their existing platforms whether the existing platforms are also cloud-based or on-premise doesn't really matter as long as ours are cloud-based. Uh, it means that we can focus on high performance and they can get high performance uptime. I think the days of cloud being a, either security or an uptime performance issue are largely over. Uh, we can easily offer 3.9 to 99.9% .9 uptime um, and probably four or five nines. Um, and also I think from a customer perspective, um, the 
us being cloud-based gives them an easy off-ramp. It means that you're no longer tied to on-premise software. It took a long time to install. You need to amortize that over a long period. And therefore, the friction in changing to a different provider is high, not because you love it, but because you're tied to it, it's complicated. There are wires hanging out all over the place. I think good SaaS cloud-based software lives and dies on its own merits. And if it's great, you'll keep using it for many years, but it shouldn't tie you to it for operational or process or technology reasons. It should be a commercial decision. And I think us being cloud-based means that our clients can extract themselves from our platform if ever they didn't find enough value and move to another one with uh, a seamless barrier to entry. That's great, that's great, thank you. Yeah, and I, I mean, you know, when we think about cloud and actually interestingly enough, uh, oftentimes when we're in conversations with retailers, they'll ask us, you know, simple questions like obviously what is the cloud, but when to utilize the cloud or how to think about when to leverage it. Um, it, it, you know, in my mind, it, it's really sort of a very simple premise, which is, you know, how do you improve your computational horsepower? Uh, and so when you think about leveraging the cloud, specifically um, from an application perspective or a decision perspective, it's really all around the premise of, you know, we have enormous amounts of data and we want to be able to process that data actually, to actually generate insights. And we want to do that at, fairly, uh, at a fairly high frequency or, you know, in some instances at web speed. And so really the value of cloud computing is look at the applications where you have an enormous amount of data where you have to make decisions or draw insights from that data uh, at web speed or you have to actually draw actions or drive actions from that data uh, fairly quickly. Those are the instances where we find cloud being sort of the most uh, valuable. And, and you know, for technology providers and where they can differentiate themselves, it's really by leveraging the cloud, taking the investment from an infrastructure perspective off of a retailer's plate and saying, you know, we can actually help you with those problems very specifically. Um, and you can sort of worry about kind of the infrastructure, the operations, et cetera. The other interesting thing that we're finding is that a lot of retailers are actually moving to the cloud themselves. So they're starting to put a lot of data uh, in the cloud, becoming more comfortable with AWS or uh, with Google. And again, I think a lot of that becomes uh, is relevant because it, you know, we live in a world where you have to have high availability of information. Uh, and specifically in an omni-channel fulfillment world, you have to have high availability of what inventory is across your network. And so that's an enormous amount of data which you have to have available. And uh, actually your SLAs around cloud are much better than they are uh, with on-prem. Yeah. So you know, I think you're seeing that shift now happen uh, much more actively. That's great, that's great. Um, so I've got one more question for the two of you and then I'd love to open up to the audience. Um, Bo you know, both of you leverage uh, machine learning in uh, your platforms. And so I'm curious as to uh, sort of how can, from someone from the outside looking in at a technology provider, you know, nearly every pitch that comes across our desk nowadays has machine learning somewhere in the pitch. And so how can you tell from the outside in who's really got machine learning? And how can you tell where it's going to be drive the most value from a business perspective? Uh, so from my side, it's fairly simple. I think it's less about the means to an end, the technology, and more about the results. So I think whether they're using uh, virtualization or machine learning or some other technology doesn't matter so much as what are the results. Um, and I think the proof is in the pudding. So I think I'd encourage you all to test vendors, uh, either with your own data sets to see how they perform in a real world situation, or look at their use cases and reference them to see uh, to what degree the technology is actually delivering on those results. In our case, the area of the supply chain for international e-commerce that we use machine learning is on duty and tax calculation. It's a very complicated area about exactly what is the right harmonization code for each product based on the country of origin to one of 220 countries in the world. And the combinatorial explosion of the number of countries, number of different product categories, number of different countries of origin, materials, is enormous. Uh, and more than that, the added complication is even though there is a, a right answer, ultimately it's assessed by a customs official, which is a person, at borders. So even the theory may end up being wrong in practice. So it's a perfect example of how you can use great machine learning. You need, for good machine learning, a great training data set. So data which is clean, where the result is correct, the outcome is right. And then you can keep feeding it with real-world data. So we do that. We see for all of our many, many hundreds of thousands of different products, 
how they're being assessed at borders, what the right duty rates are, feeding that back into the model to further improve the self-learning curve. So if a merchant was sitting opposite us, I'd encourage them to look at the quality of uh, the duty and tax rates of the products that we're shipping, or even uh, assess their catalog, and see to what degree is accurate. And I think that the proof is in the pudding and they'll see the better performance. That's great. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, obviously a lot of vendors talk about machine learning. I'd probably argue most don't actually leverage machine learning. But the simplest way to kind of think about you know, when machine learning is actually applicable or when someone's actually using it is the idea that you know, really what machine learning is trying to do is help you estimate something. And so you know, what you want to do is take data on uh, either a problem, build a model on uh, how you actually estimate whether or not something's true or not. And then if you can collect data or samples to actually prove or disprove that thesis. And so you know, where is machine learning then applicable? It's typically applicable in those areas where you actually have uh, an iterative process yourself. And so it might be through Excel, it might be through some spreadsheet where you're making a decision and then you know, next week you're basically looking to see was that the right decision or was that the wrong decision. That is sort of in almost a layman's world kind of what machine learning is trying to do. Um, and obviously there's a whole bunch of stuff underneath the hood, but it's really this idea of kind of are we estimating something correctly or not. So very specifically, you know, in our world, for instance, you know, one of our applications, we set uh, safety stock for in-store fulfillment. And so what we saw with a lot of our customers beforehand is they would literally, uh, on potentially even a weekly basis, iterate on what that should be. And we said that is the exact definition of where you can apply machine learning because you have a problem, you have a model, you're estimating something, and you're doing that on a continuous basis. So, um, you know, you really, I'd sort of think about machine learning and ask yourself, are you doing something that's iterative and that requires continuous feedback? If so, that's where machine learning is applicable. If not, then, you know, I'd, I'd raise, raise an alarm bell. <laughs>